Deep in the bowels of the earth dwell the hobgoblins, today on Dungeon Craft. If you enjoy our content, why not subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications? Thank you. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this is the first Thursday of the month, and that means it's time for our monthly campaign planning session. In this case, my source material is the classic Keep on the Borderlands by Gary Gygax, but I put my own grim dark spin on it. This month, we're doing caves D and F. I'm putting them together because they are goblins and hobgoblins, and they are connected. And also, I've already done two episodes on the goblins before. I'm going to save Cave E, which is an ogre, only it's not going to be an ogre for the next session because this video was long enough old. For this video our sources include Index Card RPG from which I'll be taking some rules concepts and The Keep on the Borderlands by Gary Gygax. This is the Goodman Games Deluxe reprint but you can get the original online at eBay for $12. Don't get ripped off. I've seen this selling on Amazon.com for like $250 or $300. There are a million copies of this module in print it is not rare, so don't pay a lot of money for it. Let's do the plot threads first. The Caves of Carnage is a sandbox, so the plot threads are sprinkled liberally throughout the story, and the players need to put them together. This is a huge part of the enjoyment of the game. It's just as important as designing combat encounters. Human beings love the idea of plot threads being introduced, speculating about where they're going, and eventually seeing them resolve. This is hardwired in our DNA. Shakespeare does it, Charles Dickens does it, Game of Thrones does it introducing clues and prophecies, and then resolving them. I encourage my players to keep notes, and keep track of plot points during the session. It's even a good idea for them to have a little notebook to keep track of the non-player characters, etc. We've got a number of plot threads we've dropped already. In episodes 3 and 4, the players were captured by the goblins and escaped. There, they met Brunner, a scholar studying goblin behavior. Brunner betrayed the characters, and now they hate him and will be looking for revenge. The rumor table has two rumors. Briark is goblin language for we surrender, and a magic wand was once lost in the lower caves. But they were sent by the witch to recover a missing magic wand she suspects is lost in the lower goblin caves, confirming the rumor to be true. So these are a lot of plot threads, all of which will be resolved in the caves, but they will feel more rewarding if the player characters know about them first. My players, for example, were thrilled when they found that wand. It meant just as much to them as a dragon's horde. Now, in the original module, the goblins live in Caves D, the ogre lives in E, and hobgoblins live in Cave F. It's much the same here, but I don't regard goblins and hobgoblins as different races. Instead, they're part of a two-tiered caste system. The goblins are the plebeians, the worker class. The hobgoblins are the ruling class. Consequently, the hobgoblins and their elites, the chief, the shaman, and Dr. Pox, live on the top level. The lower caste goblins live on the lower level. The goblin shaman spends years fattening a giant cave grub, believing it to be a potential messiah. If the grub dies, the goblins attribute it to their unworthiness and begin to grow a new grub. Although the chief is the strongest goblin physically, the shaman is more influential in their society. The target number for the typical hobgoblin is 12. They have 5 hit points and do 1 to 8 in damage. Here's the completed overview of caves D and F. So here's what the colors mean. Every color represents a target number. Yellow is 10, blue is 11, purple is 12 to 13, green is 14. In this manner, we scale the encounters. The further the player characters move into the lair and up the steps, the more difficult the encounters become. That target number is what the player characters need to do everything in that room. Can the characters sneak up on the goblins and surprise them? It's a 10. Parley with the goblins, 10. Hit them, 10. Cast a sleep spell, 10. Search the room, 10. Now I've had viewers criticize this mechanic. Can't you have a weak monster with a really tough chest in the room? Yeah, but this is faster, and looking at my color-coded map, I never need to flip or read fine print, speeding up the game. Goblins hate cats, believing them to be spies for the surface dwellers, and will skin and eat any cat they find. What goblins lack in strength they make up for in cunning and sheer numbers. They'll stalk their prey and attempt to surprise their opponents or sneak up on them from behind. A typical encounter with goblins, whether in their room or a wandering monster, will be six goblins and their hunting animal. A rat dog, giant rat, or a centipede. Each animal has a special power. Rat dogs can smell cats. 
Giant rats cause disease on a natural 20. Centipedes deliver a paralyzing sting. Their large ears give goblins an acute sense of hearing. At the start of any combat with any goblin, toss a timer die, a D4. In that many rounds, six more goblins arrive, attracted to the noise, and this will continue until the characters manage to kill the goblins in less than D4 rounds. A goblin's weakness is light. Because they're nearly blind from dwelling underground so long, any light spell will cause them to flee shrieking into the caves. They won't be gone forever, this will only work once. They'll regroup and try to attack the characters again, but it'll buy the characters some time. Goblins are fond of nasty tricks, and they include the following. 1. Green Slime Grenades On a successful hit, the character doesn't take damage unless they have nothing but cloth. Instead, the green slime hits their shield, their armor, their staff, their sword, their weapon, and completely dissolves it. And that goes for magic weapons and magic items too. Characters wearing metal armor can rip off their breastplate, but that's going to lower their armor class by two. The point is not to kill the characters, it's to weaken them for future encounters. 2. Spore Grenades The targets have to save or vomit uncontrollably for one round. The area of effect is a small room, and the goblins are impervious to the spores, they breathe them all the time. The third, the goblins will fling poo in the character's eyes. If they successfully hit, the character will then receive minus two to hit for the rest of the combat from the burning and stinging. Now let's go over some of the notable features of the lair. First, the entrance. The entrance to the goblin lair is a hole in a large tree on the south side of the ravine. When characters climb down, their target is 10. Modifiers include dexterity bonuses and plus three for using a rope and gloves. They find themselves on top of a large hill of skulls. If they fail their roll, they slide down the hill and send skulls rolling to the bottom after them. This serves as the goblin's burglar alarm. The noise will attract goblins from the guard rooms on either side of the entrance. Next is the mushroom cave. The goblin's staple food are giant mushrooms. If ingested by humans, these fungi have hallucinogenic effects. The merchant's guild will pay 50 gold pieces for a large sack. The mushrooms are guarded by a giant spider, created by Dr. Pox, who can smell the difference between goblins and invaders. 3. The Hobgoblin Door This is one of the only caves that actually has a door, and on it's written, Come in, we'd love to have you for dinner. Now, it's barred from the inside, and it's pretty much impregnable. You need a 19 or a 20 to knock it down. So it can be broken down, but not before attracting a horde of hobgoblins. More importantly, this door is a way out, and it provides access to the second tier of caves. There's also a trail leading from this door down into the woods, so now, when the characters return in the future, they can bypass the lower caves and go directly to the second tier. 3. The Prison Cells Olaf Munchberger and his wife Dagmar are kept here. Munchberger also has two retainers who will fight if given weapons, although they've lost their strength bonuses due to malnutrition. There's one goblin prisoner, Snake. Snare will work with the player characters and serve as a guide, but will betray them at a critical time in order to regain favor with his tribe. Munchberger will offer the characters 100 gold pieces in addition to his brother's reward, as well as another 100 gold pieces for the rescue of his wife. Finally, the Chieftain's Quarters. The Chief lives in a suite with two concubines and four guards. The concubines scratch at the character's eyes for d4 damage. The guards do D8 damage, but are painted with explosive runes. When killed, they explode for D4 additional damage. The chief is Skull Crusher. Target 14, hit points 20, damage D8 plus 1. The chief doesn't speak, but Brunner will also be found here. Once the characters are engaged in combat, Snare will attack the weakest character, preferably a spellcaster from behind. Then he turns and bolts down the hallway to return D4 rounds later with six more goblins. Between Skull Crusher, the treacherous Snare, and the self-righteous Brunner, this should be a hell of a fight. If cornered, Brunner will say his family, who are ironically merchants, will pay a ransom of 200 gold pieces for a safe return. All of this is absolutely true, and if the characters return Brunner to the keep, they'll be placed in a cell until the ransom is paid. Or they could just strangle him now, he only has 10 hit points. Even better, if they rip off his Plague Doctor masks, the goblins, once realizing he's human, will tear him limb from limb. I kind of like the idea of him as a recurring character, though. Snare, too, can become a recurring villain, returning again and again to plague the characters, attacking when they're most vulnerable, and running away. And that's it for this session. This is Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks for watching, I'll see you at the table, and may all your rolls be 20s.
If you enjoyed today's content, click the Dungeon Door logo to subscribe to the channel and the bell icon to receive notifications. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at DungeonCraft. 